Chapter 14 Casting Down the Accuser of the Brethren One may ask, How shall the kingdom of God come and what sort of people shall possess it? The kingdom will be seen in a love-motivated people who know the power of prayer. For when they see a need, instead of judging one another, they intercede until they are built until they are built up into all aspects in him who is their head. How the kingdom comes. Now the salvation and the power in the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before our God day and night. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down who accuses them before God day and night. Revelation 12, 10 and 11. There will be an actual point in time when the salvation, power, and kingdom of God, as well as the authority of Christ, is manifested in the earth. While we wait patiently for the fulfillment of that glorious event, the spirit of this eternal reality can be possessed any time a people determined to walk free of criticism and fault-finding and turn their sights toward purity, love, and prayer for each other. There are God-ordained procedures to initiate correction within a church. These corrections should be done by you who are spiritual in a spirit of gentleness, looking to yourself lest you to be tempted. Your motive should be to restore such a one. Galatians 6.1 Accusations against an elder, though should not even be received except on the basis of two or three witnesses. 1 Timothy 5.19 The witnesses spoken of here are eyewitnesses, not the so-called spirit witnesses someone receives apart from hard and visible facts is what I'm talking about. All too often these alleged witnesses are sent by hell to destroy the harmony of the church with rumors and gossip. This is Satan's trick. When the scriptural approach to rectifying a situation is ignored, it opens the door to fault finding, fleshly criticisms and judging. Which are the evidences that the accuser of the brethren is assaulting the church? The church is crippled, see. Listen, where these sins are operative, the movement of the Holy Spirit is restricted, salvations are few, power is minimal, and scriptural authority is crippled. Such a church is in serious danger. To be truly anointed, to bring Christ's correction to a church, one must be anointed with Christ's motives. The scriptures are plain. Jesus ever lives to make intercession for the saints. Romans 8.34 and Hebrews 7.25 God does not call us to judge each other, but to pray for one another. If we see a need in the body of Christ, we must intercede and not simply criticize. Our pattern must be to follow Christ in building and restoring, not to echo the accuser of the brethren in finding fault. Many years ago, I belonged to a national Christian organization that had a true vision from God, yet also had several serious problems. At that time, I was ministering in a small church and ministering in a bunch of small churches really and I felt perhaps we should leave this group that I had joined because of the wrong that they were doing. Together the congregation and I began to seek the Lord with periods of fasting and for 40 days sometime. At the end of the time I wrote a list of complaints holding them before God. I prayed somewhat self-righteously 
Lord, look at the errors in these people. Direct us, Lord. What should we do? Immediately the Lord replied, Have you seen these things? Yes, Lord, I answered. I have seen their sins. To which he said, So also have I. But I died for them. You go and do likewise. From that day on, I found a grace from God to seek to be a source of life and prayer wherever I was serving God. You see, we will always be serving in churches where things are wrong. Listen, our response to what we see defines our Christ-likeness. It defines our Christ-like. We are actually becoming. It defines how Christ-like we are actually defined. Or, let me say it again. You see, we will always be serving in churches where things are wrong. Our response to what we see defines how Christ-like we are actually becoming. If we see weakness in the body of Christ, our call is to supply strength. If we see sin, our response is to be an example of virtue. When we discover fear, we must impart courage. And where there is worldliness, we must display holiness. Our call is to enter the place of intercession and stand there until the body of Christ is built up in that area. That is also what we are to do in individuals with individuals that we see and see also. Is the devil at the, the throne of God? Is the devil at the throne of God? Ephesians 2 6 tells us that we have been raised up and are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Let us understand that while our bodies and souls are quite fixed here upon earth, through the agency of the Holy Spirit, our spirits have been brought into direct fellowship with Christ in heaven. From this position, we can boldly approach God's throne of grace and we can enter through prayer and worship into the true holy place of God. Hebrews 4:16, uh, 10, 19, and 20. Also, Matthew 5, 8, and Colossians 3, 1 through 5. There are many scriptures which support the truth of our positioning our positional seating with Christ. It is to examine a doctrine that has been a source of confusion for many saints. <clears throat> is Satan in heaven also? Is he in heaven also? Is he actually standing before the throne of God? Study the book of Revelation and in the description of God's throne, you will find no devil there. Chapter 4. Investigate the 12th chapter of Hebrews in the discourse concerning the heavenly Jerusalem. Again, you will see no devil in heaven. To further emphasize this, during a home meeting in Canada, I believe it was, while we were in deep worship before the Lord, the Holy Spirit opened to each of us in varying degrees a view into the heavenly Jerusalem. We saw a realm wherein there was neither darkness nor death. Everything was alive and within everything was the out raying light of God's presence and of God's pleasure and God's presence. Not only was there no need of the sun nor of any other light but there were no shadows anywhere we beheld many things but my point is simply there was no devil in heaven where then is the devil Jude tells us that Satan has been imprisoned spiritually chained with eternal bonds to darkness reserved for judgment Jude 6 Satan is imprisoned in darkness. The thought that the Heavenly Father, in whom there is no darkness at all, 1 John 1, 5, would countenance the devil intruding upon the eternal worship, accusing the very church for whom his son had died, is unimaginable. If this is so, how do we explain the scriptures which allude to the devil being in heaven? 
First, we need to understand that there are three realms known as heaven in the Bible. The first and most commonly identified as such is the eternal abode of the blessed, the heavenly dwelling of the Trinity, the angels and the redeemed. Next, the word heaven is used to describe the sky. The heavens declare the glory of God, Psalm 19.1. But when the Bible says that Satan is in the heavenly places, or heaven, Ephesians 6, 12, Revelation 12, uh, 11, Luke 10, 18, it is referring to a relatively unknown dimension of life, the spirit realm. This heaven, which immediately surrounds the consciousness of man, is the spiritual territory from which Satan seeks to control the world. It would be foolish to assume we know more than we do about this dimension because we don't, but we know this. It is from here that Satan releases his war against the church. If it is true that the devil is not in the highest heaven, how then does he accuse the saints before the throne of God? We begin to discourse. We begin this discourse by explaining that Christ has positioned our spirits in him before God's throne. While our spirits connect us to God, our bodies and souls are here on earth. Although the devil does not have immediate access to God, he does have access to our thoughts in our words. When we harbor sympathetic attitudes toward fault finding, when we justify gossip and negative criticism, we are actually giving Satan the use of our mouths to accuse the saints before God. We have wrongly assumed that our whispers spoken in darkness remained hidden even from God. We must realize that all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4.13 it, Is it not written, What you have said in the darkness shall be heard in the light? Luke 12.3 God who is light indeed hears the voice of the accuser, even in the guarded confidences spoken to a spouse. Guard your tongue. Much of what the Father supplies to the body of Christ is furnished through our confession. This is not simply our positive premeditated confession expressed in prayer. It consists of everything that comes out of our mouths. Did not Christ himself say men shall be judged for every idle or careless word that they speak? Matthew 12, 36. Listen. Please understand, please understand what we're saying. Please, please listen. Please listen. Did not Christ himself say men shall be judged for every idle or careless word that they speak? Matthew 12, 36. Our words are the overflow of the condition of our hearts. Listen. Christ as the high priest of our confession, Hebrews 3.1, takes our words, whether in faith or in unbelief, and allocates back to us eternal life in proportion to our words. When our tongue, listen, when our tongue is unbridled, James tells us that our negative confession sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. James 3, 6. If we are supportive of one another, loving one another, protecting one another, we experience much growth and greater protection. If, however, we are finding fault, criticizing, and tailbearing, the voice of the accuser is manifested and we are judged for our idle and evil words. God looks at what we have said and gives us reality accordingly. Consequently, we must come to understand that each of our thoughts and even our most intimate conversations with men are prayers we are offering to the Father who sees all things continually and in secret. 
these unaddressed prayers are just as much a part of our confession as our dear Lord prayers, and they are just as influential. Our words about one another, as well as our words to one another, should carry with them the same sense of reverence as when we speak with God, for He is indeed listening. Other tongues are flaming tongues. It is significant that when Isaiah saw the Lord, Isaiah 6, not only was there no devil in heaven, but the guilt he felt was due to his words. He said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Verse 5. The fact is, our criticisms of one another are the voice of Satan accusing the saints before God. Isaiah's lips were cleansed as they were touched by a burning coal taken from the altar of God. The closer we truly draw to God, the more guilt we shall feel for our unclean words. When the Holy Spirit was manifested upon Jesus, he came symbolically in the form of a dove. But when the Spirit was revealed at Pentecost, he appeared as flaming tongues of fire. Certain segments of Christianity have made speaking in other tongues a sign of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. For us, the issue shall not be speaking in foreign tongues, but flaming tongues, tongues which have been purified by the fire of God from the altar, tongues that are cleansed of fault finding and criticisms. Casting down the accuser. Listen. Casting down the accuser. And they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And they did not love their own lives even unto death. Revelation 12, 10 and 11. Instead of talking about people's sins and faults, we must ask God for the grace to see our common needs met. Listen. Instinctively, we must enter into the intercession of Christ and passionately intercede for those for whom Jesus died. In Revelation 12, we see how they overcame the accuser of the brethren. Let us look at each dimension of our victory separately. First, the blood of the Lamb. One blood spiritually flows through all, through us all, literally making us one body, sharing one source of cleansing and one source of life. One blood makes us family, blood bought and blood relatives. See. The blood pays for our redemption and in the attack of the accuser disarms his accusations. The blood establishes us in an attitude of meekness rather than self-righteousness for the shedding of the blood declares our common need of Jesus. Secondly, the word of their testimony. This includes telling others what God has done for you, but it is more. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy, Revelation 19.10. To truly overcome the enemy, we must live and think prophetically. That is, we must see each other as God sees us, seeing the end from the beginning, animated by lives of vision, confessing our faith for one another. Knowing and speaking the living word of God enables us to overcome the illusions of the enemy. 1 Timothy 1.18 Thirdly, loving not our own lives, even unto death. We cannot overcome Satan and simultaneously harbor self-pity and sympathy for that which needs to be crucified within us. Our victory is consummated by our willingness to go even to death rather than betray our convictions of truth. Paul said, I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself that I may finish my course. Acts 20:24. 20, Those who establish the kingdom are uncompromising with their own hurts. They may ache but not withdraw. 
they may live. They live by faith. The accuser must be cast down first in our minds. We cannot tolerate fault finding and accusations. We must possess the very heart of God toward our brethren. The kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ will be seen in a people who are terminally committed to love motivated prayer. Listen, the kingdom of God and the authority of his Christ will be seen in a people who are terminally committed to love motivated prayer. For when they see a need, instead of becoming critical, they cast down the accuser of the brethren and they pray.